My history with Fire Emblem is tumultuous. I picked up Awakening as my first, and dropped it shortly after. I emulated Path of Radiance a few years after that, and forgot about it after a few chapters. My final shot was with Fates, specifically Conquest, and I gave up on that about 10 chapters in. Which is odd, because I distinctly remember enjoying myself for the brief few weeks that I played it. I really enjoyed pairing the characters up and reading their support conversations. It provided context to the skirmishes within larger battles. Beyond even support conversations, I could construct a relationship in my head based on how I felt these characters would interact on the battlefield. I came to love Fates as a management simulator, but I think that's exactly why I ended up dropping it and all the other Fire Emblem games. It was so easy for me to get overwhelmed. You just get unit after unit after unit, and attempting to play by the no-death mantra of Fire Emblem would inevitably stress me out. Keeping track of so many characters, some that I didn't even like, and making sure that none of them died, was a monumental task for someone who isn't an experienced SRBG player. It was especially cruel in some of the later chapters, which had very long maps. Moment-to-moment -moment gameplay started to feel more like a grind, where I would position my units to ensure they wouldn't fall behind in experience, which would inevitably lead to more screw-ups due to bad unit placement. I recognize that this is why people love Fire Emblem, but those beloved elements core to its appeal were ironically the biggest reasons I could never penetrate its thick hide. Enter Fire Emblem Three Houses, a game I heard next to nothing about. Inspired by my somewhat uncharacteristic purchase of Octopath Traveler, I bought Three Houses in the hopes that this would finally be the time I'd get into Fire Emblem. My hopes weren't unrealistically high, but hey, there was always a chance it would click this time, right? Uh, yeah. So that happened. Keep in mind, I am not a Fire Emblem fan. A lot of what I say in this video may also be strengths of some previous game I've yet to play or finish. I am in no way pretending to know which parts of Three Houses are unique or revolutionary, only that, to a relative newcomer, this game seems remarkable. I promise I'll go back and try the other games in earnest. I would have liked to avoid spoilers to the best of my ability, but many of the reasons I love this game cannot be talked about except with specific references, so I'm sorry to say there will be potential spoilers for the entire game. Well, actually not for the Golden Deer route, because I still need to start my third playthrough. By the way, this is not meant to be some all-encompassing analysis, it's just meant to be a collection of my initial stray thoughts. That's what learning to love has kind of become, honestly. If by some ridiculous miracle my third playthrough turns me off the game, maybe I'll make another video. Remember when I said my favorite part of Fates was the unit management? Support conversations, marriage, all that stuff? That carries over to three houses in an evolved format. You're now a professor at a religious monastery teaching your units as students. You're given so much control over where your students will end up and who they'll bond with. It takes a page out of the Persona playbook, giving you a few days each month of time management. I recall in Fates I would constantly pair up units that hadn't been bonded yet so I could raise their support level and view more conversations. However, this made each map more of a slog, since it severely limited the strategic use of my units in combat. I always felt like I had to decide. Do I sacrifice support conversations? Or do I sacrifice my potential in combat? Three Houses still has this mechanic, but it's now the least useful way to deepen the bonds between units as far as I'm concerned. Since you can run around the monastery and have lunch with them, or bring them their lost items based on their character quirks, or give them gifts to raise affinity on the spot, it takes the unit management out of combat entirely and presents a second mode where you can give it more focus. Now, much like you would restock and organize your units before a battle, you can deal with the relationship stuff at a designated time outside of battle. Doing this will also raise their motivation, which you can use in your lessons to dole out bonus experience for individual stats. I became obsessed with visiting my students each month. It initially feels like a daunting task, but it never once felt repetitive. You are very rarely forced to explore, so whenever you choose that option, you're likely doing it for a reason. I was always interested in what my students had to say, especially after major plot revelations. You get to watch each character grow over time, which will often coincide with their support conversations. 
For instance, you can tell that although Edelgard is still committed to her ideals, your role in her life has definitely softened her edges. Bernadetta breaks out of her shell, Ferdinand learns that he doesn't always need to be the best, Linhart finally finds his own motivation, Dimitri moves past his lust for revenge, Dedu overcomes the prejudices lobbied at him. Since you've taken an active role in their lives, trained them to be the best they can be, led them through thick and thin, it's hard not to feel an incredible sense of pride by the end of it all. They shone brighter since there weren't very many of them to keep track of. I really only recruited faculty members and one Golden Tier member later in the story who I barely even used after I got her. This meant that my core group of students didn't change all that much, and I could focus on strengthening those core members. It always overwhelmed me when other Fire Emblem games would gradually pile on more and more units, sending me into a state of shock trying to manage them all. It was a frankly genius move to split the game into the different houses. That way, you don't have to compromise on the amount of units you send the player's way, and can give them the option of interacting with those units on another playthrough instead of trying to manage them all at once. There's a reason games like Persona don't have 30 main characters. Several of them would inevitably fall through the cracks. I also like that they can basically be made into whatever you want. Some units are more inclined to specific pathways. The high dex units will usually go the way of the bow, which is the same with the magic stat. However, units who have higher strength can be classed into practically anything you want if you're dedicated enough to teach them. You can update their goals to focus on leveling whatever stat you want. In fact, one of my favorite parts of the game was figuring out where I wanted each unit to go. I could make Dedu into a War Master, so he could rip through enemies with axes and gauntlets, but then I noticed that his inclination toward heavy armor could help fill in a gap on my team to resist bowmen and other weak physical units. I love that you can take him down either pathway and he'll still be useful. Should I keep Ingrid as a dancer, or do I want her to become a Pegasus Knight? Not only will it keep repeat playthroughs a little more fresh, it allows the player to craft a team they're more comfortable with. Of course, you can recruit a bunch of different units if that's where you're used to, but I find that it overcomplicates the teaching process and eventually some units are just gonna fall by the wayside. Thanks to this deeper understanding of my units, I was able to play each map more tactically. One new battle change comes with the eradication of the weapon triangle, yet another bold step forward for the franchise. Instead of having a rock-paper-scissors style approach to combat, there are now weapon arts with certain advantages. At the cost of more weapon durability, you can throw out powerful attacks that might even do extra damage against specific classes. Thanks to this change, I feel like I can more easily split up my core team without worrying about running into the dreaded weapon triangle. Sure, there are still situations like flying units being weak to bows and armored units being weak to magic, but it's a lot less limiting than the general weapon triangle. You can even unlock special combat arts or abilities by leveling up stats that would otherwise be unusual for the unit to learn. Hubert, for instance, who is clearly a mage, can learn a unique combat art if you train him to use a lance. This will also double up as preparation for an eventual promotion to the Dark Knight class. All of this reframes your pre-game strategy. If you send a lance user to fight an axe user, you won't be statistically screwed, but maybe if you sent a different unit, they'd have a more useful combat art for that situation. A lot of these maps prevent you from turtling all of your units, usually with a time limit or alternate objective. Chapter 11 had a noteworthy incentive along those lines. The enemy would send a bunch of units to steal crest stones throughout the map, practically forcing you to spread out your own units if you want better rewards at the end of battle. There's a map where you not only need to protect an ally, but you also have to seek out bishops on either side of the fog to stop them from spawning more allies. You also have the option of seeking out the enemy commander to potentially end the battle quicker, but you don't want to spread your units too thin, or you won't be able to protect that ally in the middle of the map. There's a map with thieves in the middle, and several different exits for them to use in various corners. You practically need four different groups to effectively cut off every exit, which was a welcome challenge and a nice change of pace. A lot of map objectives involve a bonus like this. Save all the students, make sure your allies don't die, etc. They point you in the right direction without absolutely forcing you to play out of your comfort zone. It subtly taught me to spread my units out a little more to use them more efficiently. There really isn't much benefit to centralizing all of your units, and it's good that many of the early maps teach you this in preparation for the more challenging ones later on. Most people I've asked have said that this game has fairly average map design compared to the rest of the series, so I'm really interested to go back and play some of the higher rated entries. Decisions are made even more difficult with the introduction of monster units. These behemoths are a force to be reckoned with if you don't have a sound strategy going in. They have at least four different weakness squares, which all need to be broken to not only get an item, but to stun it for a turn. 
The catch is that these monsters have multiple health bars and get stronger each time you kill them. Since so many of these maps already ask you to split up your units, you can't simply turtle your way through these. You have to really think about who you're sending where, and what their backup looks like. If your subgroup is ill-prepared to deal with a monster, along with the units that will most assuredly accompany that monster, the game will punish you for that oversight. It's especially apparent on higher difficulties, which seem to tweak enemy AI to make them more aggressive. Or at least, that's what I noticed while contrasting my normal and hard playthroughs. My initial normal difficulty playthrough was actually a lot more challenging than I expected. I picked that difficulty because I was sick of soft resetting every time I lost a unit in other games, so I wasn't about to choose hard right out of the gate and hate myself. While the early game was fairly simple, post time skip was pretty damn scary at some points. This was likely due to my inexperience with the genre, but that's exactly my point here. I'm glad that normal existed to ease me into it more gradually. My initial playthrough taught me the do's and don'ts of tactics more effectively than any past Fire Emblem game precisely because it didn't kick my ass at every possible point. Divine Pulse is a miracle in that regard. I'm not sure how Fire Emblem purists feel about this mechanic, but it is probably one of the best additions to the series. While I don't know a lot about Fire Emblem, perhaps the biggest barrier to entry was always losing units. I would get so far in each game and inevitably run into a brick wall where I would always lose at least one unit and have to keep repeating each map over and over and over until I eventually just dropped it. This punishment for bad tactics is really strict, and the solution they arrived at for Fates is to introduce a game mode where your units can't die. Seems like it would fix the problem on paper, but it just made the game way too easy. These games are not built to be brute forced, which is why I imagine permadeath was implemented in the first place. There are some maps in Three Houses where your units can't actually die, and those were always the least exciting maps because I knew that nothing bad would happen as long as my leader didn't die. You can probably see what happened in Fates when I tried playing a few maps without that penalty. It was really boring. I did try playing Fates the standard route, but then I was struck with the opposite effect. I couldn't make any progress because I kept making small mistakes that got my characters killed. It was hard to learn anything from these mistakes because I had to redo the entire map. By the time I climbed back up to where I was, I had already forgotten what I did wrong. It's not a good way to teach new players. While Divine Pulse might seem like a get out of jail free card, I found that it gives the player the opportunity to immediately learn from their mistakes. Perhaps I misjudged a unit's placement, or didn't provide enough backup, or was simply taken aback by a gambit I wasn't anticipating. I could simply turn back time and set up a better plan. If Divine Pulse didn't exist, I may very well have dropped three houses. That might seem like a petty reason to drop something, but I don't necessarily mean that in a malicious way. I dropped the other three games I tried by accident, mostly. I would just get to a point where I would be so fed up with resets that I'd forget to keep trying and eventually move on. It was always that initial learning hump I had to jump over, and Three Houses makes that jump so much simpler for a strategy normie like me. You can raise your pulses to an almost absurd degree through the goddess statues, but I appreciate that it's optional to go beyond six pulses. That number felt just right for my subsequent hard playthroughs. Now I can focus on more insane tasks, like killing the Death Knight in an early chapter of my own volition, instead of struggling just to finish the main story without casualties. Once I was over that initial hump, it washed over me like a wave. I couldn't put the game down. I cared so much for my students that forcing me to kill them after the time skip felt like a cruel joke. A majority of the story, for at least two of the pathways, is focused on two of the houses cutting each other down for various reasons. Edelgard intends to be rid of the nobility by eliminating crests, but she doesn't care what sacrifices need to be made to achieve that goal. Dimitri wants to make sure no one goes through the loss of family and friends the way he did, but is so blinded by revenge that he ends up forging a bloodier path than he likely ever intended. Whichever of the two houses you choose in this scenario, you can't magically wish for things to get better. You get to see both sides, bond with the leaders, understand and love them as people. You then kill the opposition. My first playthrough was the Black Eagle House, where I sided with Edelgard and started a war with the Church, which in turn meant a war with Dimitri. You can choose to spare Claude if you want, but you must kill Dimitri. There's no weaseling your way out of it. You watched Adu, Dimitri's right-hand man, throw away his own humanity in order to protect him. At that point, I began to wonder if I was even on the right side. When I beat Dimitri, I didn't feel happy or satisfied. I felt a sense of dread booming over me. What did any of it mean if these are the bodies we had to trample over to get here? Our goals were just. We wanted to get rid of the class system that had undeniably been causing pain throughout Fodlin, 
but we accepted the power of some truly evil individuals to achieve that goal. Was it worth it? It's a genuinely tough question that I still have no answer to. Three Houses likes to bathe in this pessimistic outlook. As far as I know, there is no all-encompassing happy ending like you'd come to expect. There's no last story, there's no revelations, there's no cheery fun time where everyone gathers around the campfire to remember the good old days. It's just war. War between characters you've come to like. War that you can never prevent. War that is never pleasant. Just war. My favorite map exemplifies this the best. As big class reunions go, this one's gotta be the worst in history. Years ago, we fought here as classmates. But not today. Kill every last one of them! So we fight on. A battle that we all knew would have to happen eventually. A reunion between the houses, who all have their own reasons for being there. Edelgard commands the battlefield with most of her forces. In fact, the map punishes you heavily for trying to dominate the center, which is foreshadowed by the previous mock battle at this same location. The stakes are much lower back then, you can't permanently lose anyone, and so you learn that maybe occupying the middle isn't the best strategy overall, since you'll be fighting a war on two fronts. It would likely be best to tackle each army one at a time. Edelgard will burn the central ballista if you occupy it for too long, stunning your forces and leaving them open to attacks from both the Empire and the Alliance. I definitely had to restart after that one, it caught me way off guard. I figured it would be better to flank Edelgard, take out Hubert, and let the Alliance take care of the Empire forces occupying the middle. There's actually a unique quote from Edelgard if you flank the right side of the map, where she acknowledges that things have not gone according to her plan since she clearly wanted to target Dimitri, but sets the center on fire anyway to at least hold off the Alliance forces. Hubert will comment on whichever side you pick, seemingly an acknowledgement by the game that there are multiple approaches you can take. In the end, I actually found it more lucrative to rush Claude and save the remainder of Edelgard's forces for later. This did leave my army more open to attacks from the center, but rushing Claude before his reinforcements could arrive helped a lot in the long run. Especially since Claude and Lysithea are some of the most deadly units on the map. So many approaches, so much to think about, and so much to grapple with. Every kill comes with a quote lamenting their defeat, and a solemn word from their house leader. It's not supposed to feel rewarding. It's war. Bad things happen seemingly on a whim. Fires break out, units come in from out of nowhere, three forces are engaged simultaneously, your units could perish at any moment, and at some points it's simply unpredictable. Who's going to target who? Where do I place my units for the most defense? How can I best utilize my gambits to stave off enemy troops? Those are all relatively simple questions to answer with enough critical thought. But those harder questions remain, even after the credits roll. You can fret over victory all you like, divine pulse to fix mistakes, make better decisions, completely dominate the battlefield, but you'll never be able to truly cope with what you've done. In the end, what is war if not a spectacle of the damned?